Sometimes a question can change your life. In 1985, when Wayne Tesh was an associate pastor down in uh, Costa Mesa, someone came up to him and she said there are 10,500 reported cases of child abuse in Orange County. What are you going to do about it? And those of you who have heard me speak here at Biola know that uh, we're preparing you to take on the big challenges of this world. And uh, today is an example of someone who answered that question, what are you going to do about it, in a way that not only changed his own life, but that first year with 37 kids involved in Royal Family Kids Camp to today, um, each summer, over 6,000 kids, over 8,000 adults serving these kids in nine countries around the world uh, in ways that are making a difference in the lives of children who for most of their days know what it's like to be abused and maybe whacked with a two by four or burnt with a cigarette or the only time they're being hugged is when they're about to be molested. For one week in their year, they gather together around people who love them and pour themselves into them and affirm them and tell them that God has a plan for their lives and takes those nightmares they live in so much of the year and turn them into dreams. Wayne Tesh is a founder, architect, visionary, and inspiration behind Royal Family, Family Kids Camp, which has made a difference in the lives of tens of thousands of children who many people have given up on. So will you give it up for Wayne Tesh as he comes and speaks to us today. Wayne, welcome to Biola University. Wayne and I went to the same college many years ago um, at different times, but uh, it's wonderful to have you, my brother in Christ, here. Not that many years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, have a good one. Thank you. <laughs> hey, I have some great news for you. Seniors, do you realize that you have 63 more chapels left? <laughs> Juniors, do you realize you have 153 more chapels left? Sophomores. 243 more chapels left. Freshmen. Oh, yeah. 333 more chapels left. I have sat where you have sat. And when we went to that college together, we had to go five times a day. Uh, five times a week. It felt, like, it felt like five times a day sometimes. And that's without, that's without the cuts that you would normally get. And any good self-respecting Biola grad would probably take 80% of your cuts in chapel, I would imagine. I don't know, but I would imagine. But I want you to know, I have sat where you've sat, I have studied, I have slept during chapel. <laughs> Some of the speakers were really, mm, But every once in a while, the Spirit of the Lord would show up and something would spark deep within and you knew that God was stirring in our hearts and minds. So with that, I pray that this is one of those days that the Spirit would show up and begin to work on you like God worked on me when I sat where you sat. We work with children, children who have been thrown up against walls and locked in closets, children who hide under their beds in fear and whose nightmares are real. We work with children who have been beaten by two by fours, whipped with bicycle chains, and burned with cigarette butts. Children who for one week in the Cathedral of the Outdoors Surrounded by God's people, their heart is restored, their mind is renewed, and hope is birthed within children's lives. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is found in Mark chapter 2, and I'd like to read that, and then we'll go from this. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the People heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. 
Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus and opening made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praise God, saying, we have never seen anything like this before. Imagine with me, there's a (laughs) knock at the door. And four friends come to to the home of their friend, and they hear within within that room, come on in. They open the door, and they walked in, and they said, guess what? Jesus is in town. And where Jesus is, great things begin to happen. The blind can see, the deaf can hear, the lame can walk, and we're going to take you to Jesus. So they lifted him up on his stretcher, and they walked down those narrow streets of Capernaum, and they came to the place where Jesus was preaching and was packed with people, and they couldn't get in. Now, President Barry, this isn't in Scripture. But I imagine they would put them down. They probably had a little holy huddle, and they got together, and they said, what are we going to do now? And one of them came up with the bright idea and said, why don't we go up on the roof? They come back to their friend and said, guess what? We've got this all taken care of. We're going to go up on the roof. And the poor paralyzed individual probably says, the roof? He's never been up there before. So they begin to walk up those steps. And if you've ever lived in a two-story building, or if you've ever been in a second story of a dormitory, and you had to carry a mattress up on the second floor, you know there's a slight angle that you're carrying. (laughs) And I imagine that this poor paralyzed man was hanging on. It was a white knuckle ride for him as he was carried up to the steps. And they get up there and they say, now what are we going to do? And they put him down and they probably have another little holy huddle and they get together and they say, why don't we dig a hole in the roof? And I can imagine one guy goes, one, two, I think I saw Jesus standing under here. Why don't we just dig a hole right here? Get them close to Jesus. And Jesus, the Jesus I know, and I'm sure the Jesus you know, he knows what's going on. He knew they were up on the roof. And pretty soon dust started to descend like snow on Jesus' head. Pretty soon some great big dirt clogs started to come down. And Jesus being Jesus, he moves because he's not going to get hit by the big ones. And he's got everything under control. And there's people looking up and saying, wow, what's going on up there? Hands coming through the roof. Now, I've often wondered, and this isn't in Scripture either, but I've often wondered, how big of a hole do you make in a roof to let a paralyzed man come through? Do you let him come down vertically? (laughs) Do you let him come down horizontally? They could have just dropped him. He was going to be healed anyways, but they didn't know that at the time. So very carefully, very carefully, they lowered the mat the man was lying on, and they lowered him in front of Jesus. And the searchlight of the Spirit just went into this guy's life. 
And he knew that something great was about to happen. Because when you're in the presence of Jesus, you forget everything, but you begin to go, wow, this is kind of neat. I enjoy being here. Something great's going to happen. And Jesus, he looks at him and he said, my son, your sins are forgiven. But that you may know that I'm the son of man, I say unto you, arise. Arise from your pain. Arise from your problems. Arise from a mind that has you so paralyzed that you cannot comprehend nor understand the goodness of God. Arise. One of the interesting things that I know about working with children, I went to that college with you, is that they grow up and they become adults. And one of the things that I know about adults who come from a background of great suffering and abuse, one thing I know is that many times they become fixated on their past. It's like driving down the I-5 freeway and you're driving along and you become, you look in your rear view mirror, you look in your side view mirrors, but people who have a background of abuse many times becomes, they become fixated on their past, and they go through life just driving, looking where they've been instead of what God has for them to be. And when you drive with your eyes fixated on the past, you're gonna end up in a, in a wreck. Accidents are going to occur to you because the God I serve says, I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. Plans for good, not evil. Plans that'll give you a hope and a future. That's the God I serve. And that's what he wants. He doesn't want you to be chained in the back, looking where you've been. He wants you to become new in him. And as you start your adult life together, or as you just start it with and you work with Christ walking this world, making an impact on the poor and the needy. Don't become just fixated on the past. Understand God has a grand and glorious future for you. Well, back to the story. I've often wondered, and this isn't in scripture either, but I've often wondered, if you were one of the four people up on the roof and you were looking down and you saw your friend stand up, what would you do? I know what I would do. I'd jump through the hole in the roof. i come down, i give my friend a great big bear hug. i go up to Jesus and give him a high five and say, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Because when you experience a miracle, it's like an artesian well. You can't put a capstone on it. It just bubbles up and keeps going and going and going. And you just don't want to leave. Now, this is in Scripture. The people that wouldn't let him come in, wow, they parted as he picked up his stretcher. Yeah, probably had a little New York strut and just went on home, <laughs> feeling good all over. Now this isn't in scripture either, but I've often wondered. I'm from, I'm from a camping background, so you always make things better. I've often wondered, who fixed the hole in the roof? Have you wondered that? I have. So I imagine the next day there's a knock at the door. And instead of a voice calling, come on in, there's a man that walks and opens up that door. And he sees his four friends, and instead of four friends walking down that narrow street of Capernaum, there's five. And instead of carrying a stretcher, they're carrying their toolkits. And instead of four men walking up those steps, there's five that ascend those stairs. And there with fresh mud and palm from, the man that was healed took his finger and wrote in that fresh mud, I was healed by Jesus, signed his name, put the date, and someday some archaeologist is going to find that. 
There are three million reported cases of child abuse, and they're lying on the stretcher. And they need the people of God, men and women who have a heart to grab a handle and take them to Jesus. Because Jesus can renew a heart. He can restore a mind. He can give hope to the hopeless. Jesus is the one that can make a difference in your life. Jesus. 1985, I received a phone call. And it was from the head psychiatrist of the Orange County Mental Health Unit who said, Reverend Tetch, I understand that you're running a camp for abused children and I have a seven-year-old boy that is in a lockdown, 24-hour surveillance cell because he's attempted suicide three times as a seven-year-old. I said, tell me, tell me your, you, tell, tell me a story. He said, well, in December, he was singing Christmas carols with the Sunday school teacher, walking through a senior citizen's home when a man, an evil man, enticed this little seven-year-old boy to come into his room and there for the next 45 minutes did all sorts of horrific, horrendous things on this little boy's body. When he was finished with them, he opened up the window of his first floor room and threw Jonathan out the window. There the Sunday school teacher found him in the garden, so traumatized he couldn't cry, bloodied, bruised, and battered. They took him to an emergency hospital, and there his mom met him, and this little kid who was singing Christmas songs because perpetrators, they could care less about what you're doing. They just have one thing on their mind. And they abused little Jonathan. And from December till June, he had attempted suicide three times. He said, I think he would really appreciate it if he could be outdoors, where the sun could be on his face. And the trees are big and strong and tall. And wind is blowing through those trees. There's something about healing that takes place in the cathedral of the outdoors. So I said, wow, yeah, send him, send him. So we, he came to camp that first year in 1985. You always remember those cases when you first start anything. Been doing this now for, what, 25 years? It's amazing what God does. But Jonathan sticks out. And um, we had 24 hour surveillance on him because we didn't want him to run out in the woods and get lost or do anything destructive to his little body. And when he would get up in the morning, he would say to me, Pastor Tesh, could you check the restroom to make sure it's okay? And I'd walk in the restroom and look around and come back out and announce to Jonathan, Jonathan, everything's okay, you can go in. And he said, could you stand guard so no one else could come in? I said, I'll stand guard. Little Jonathan never took a shower the whole week, highly medicated. We didn't know if things were really getting through to him. We were wondering, my goodness, is this really worth it? Is this kid getting anything out of what's going on? He came back when he was eight, came back to camp when he was nine, when he was 10. I'll remember, I'll always remember this one. I see his mother pull up in the church parking lot and Jonathan gets out of the car and I see him from the parking lot and I yell out to him, Jonathan, hey, bud. He looks and he comes running towards me. 
I get down on one knee, I open up my arms, and he just collapses in my arms, and I just hug him. And all of a sudden, I notice something. I said, Jonathan, something's happened in your life. Wow, I can see it in your eyes. I can see it on your smile. Just the way you ran, you had a spring in your step. Wow, what happened? What happened? And he looked down at me. He said, Pastor Tesh, you know that man that did all those bad things to me? I said, yeah. He said, I forgive them. And if you come from a background of abuse, one out of three women, one out of six to seven men have experienced some form of abuse. I grew up in a church where I heard sermons on adultery. I heard sermons on abortion. I heard sermons on dysfunctional families because of drug abuse and alcohol abuse. But I never heard a sermon on child abuse. And Jesus said, if you harm or touch one of these, it's better that a millstone be hung around your neck and you're cast in the depths of the sea. I'd like to start a new ministry and call it Millstone Ministry. <laughs> you have a size 16 neck. You harm a child. I have a millstone for you. And I could take you out in the ocean and baptize you forever. <laughs> I can get into that. Because you see, forgiveness is what it's about. I don't understand how it all works. You would think that the perpetrator would ask your forgiveness. But that's not Jesus' way. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When you can settle that question in your life, you will not have so many wrecks as you go traveling down this road of life when you can forgive the people who have abused and neglected you. You'll be free. You'll be able to comprehend God's grace. And you'll be able to share that with others. And when you begin to share grace with other people, there's something special. People just come alongside and say, what can I do to help you? Be grace givers. In the world you live, if there's anything they need out there, in here, is grace. And when you can do that, that makes all the difference in the world. We say children from 7 to 11, they have a divine appointment from heaven. They can come to camp. But in reality, we take children 6 to 12 because I was a minister long enough to know that when I said age 6, there's always a mother that would always say, I have a very mature 5-year-old. Could they go? By saying 7, we take 6-year-olds and it's, we leave the 5-year-olds out. So um, Jonathan came back and his counselor said, Jonathan, what do you want to be when you grow up? And Jonathan typical in Orange County, said, I want to make lots of money. <laughs> you want to make lots of money. Why do you want to make so much money? He said, so I can buy Royal Family Kids Camp. So you can buy Royal Family Kids Camp. Why is that? He said, so that other children can feel what I felt being here. Dreams of 12-year-old boys can become a reality. And I can tell story after story. There's literature out there. Just feel free to take as much as you want. We have 162 camps in 38 different states across America. If you'd be interested in belonging or like to be involved in one of the camps, there's one here at North Hills in Berea. I'm sure... That there be opportunity for you to serve for a week. Get involved. But one boy said to me, Pastor Tesh, 
Me and Jesus, we've got a lot in common. Now, I've never heard that before. (laughs) I've heard lots of things, but I've never heard me and Jesus, we've got a lot in common. I said, what's that? He goes, we both have foster dads by the name of Joseph. I was in a Catholic church speaking in Cudahy, Wisconsin. And as I walked in that church on the left-hand side of, the, of this incredible church, it was stained glass windows. There were three on one on the left side, three on the right side. And the one on the left, the first one, had a picture of Joseph. And it said, foster father of Jesus in a Catholic church. I've learned so much in my years of helping the poor, the needy, the abused, the abandoned. It is one of the most exciting rides you could ever be on. It is thrilling. Make sure you become a stretcher bearer. Because one thing I know about being a minister, someday you two are going to be lying on that stretcher, whether it's through death, divorce, discouragement, disability, depression, you two are going to be lying on that stretcher. And you're going to need to have God's people lift you and take you to Jesus. Because Jesus, he's the one that renews a mind and restores a heart. Let Jesus be triumphant in your world today. As you go from this gymnasium, go in the power and the grace of God. See the world that is suffering and realize that you are an answer to somebody's prayer when you fulfill the call that God has for your life. Be a stretcher bearer in the kingdom. Father, what a privilege it is to stand before young men and women who have a heart that is turned towards you. Lord, I pray that you'll lift them Let them be able to see and comprehend the goodness that you have for them. And Lord, may they make the right choices along the way to influence this world for you. May you be the, may they be the people of God. May they be stretcher bearers in this world today. In Christ's name, amen.